Well, good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's webinar. Today's talk is entitled, A Vast Unmet Need, Challenges in Alzheimer's Clinical Trials. My name is Andrew Jordan and I'll be your XTalks host for today. Now today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. And this webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit your questions and your comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. Now this chat box is located in the control panel that's on the right hand side of your screen and if you require any assistance you can contact me at any time by sending a message using that chat panel. And at this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode, and please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future download. And now a big thanks to Premier Research, who developed the content for this webinar. Premier Research is a leading clinical development service working with highly innovative biotech, specialty pharmaceutical, and medical device companies. The company has a wealth of experience in neuroscience research, having managed over 185 projects in the past five years alone. And its services include clinical research and regulatory outsourcing in the areas of analgesia, dermatology, medical devices, neuroscience, oncology, pediatrics, rare disease. Uh, they operate in 84 countries, employ 1,100 plus clinical professionals and have a strong international network of clinical monitors and project management professionals combined with regulatory, data management, statistical, scientific, and medical experts and staff at its well-established network of clinical sites. All right, now I'd like to introduce you to your speakers for today's webinar. Krista Armstrong has held leadership roles for project management and operations delivery at Premier Research and now oversees the Neuroscience Business Unit. This business unit includes Premier's most experienced neuroscience clinical research professionals for psychiatric and neurological indica indications uh, to ensure that the Premier team provides sponsors with the best possible regulatory and scientific medical and operational delivery advice. Dr. Armstrong's primary therapeutic and operational expertise has had a specific emphasis on psychiatric indications such as ADHD, schizophrenia, mood disorders, ASD, eating disorders, substance use disorders, and PTSD as well as neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, and stroke. Now, Dr. Armstrong's clinical research experience spans more than 20 years in both academia and the pharmaceutical industry. And at Premier Research, she led the integration of six acquisitions and grew the clinical operations department from 60 to more than 500 employees globally. All right. And Dr. Sebastian Turek is a project director in project management with a focus on neuroscience. Previously, he worked in academia as well as various clinical research organization sectors holding positions in clinical development and project management at a large CRO. Now, Dr. Turek has more than 10 years experience in clinical research managing clinical trials and program deliveries across North America, Latin America, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific, uh, from target phase one pharmacokinetics and phase two proof of concept studies, as well as large multi-vendor phase three programs, predominantly in Alzheimer's disease. All right, and now it's my pleasure to hand the microphone over to your first speaker for today. And that's Dr. Krista Armstrong. Krista. All right, thank you, Andrew, and welcome everyone. On behalf of Premier Research and the Neuroscience Business Unit, I wanna thank you for your interest in our webinar today. It happens to be a topic that's very near and dear to me personally, having experienced firsthand the unbearably debilitating effects of this disease on family members, past and present. It only takes a moment to spend with a family member suffering from Alzheimer's to feel the anguish of looking into the eyes of a mother, a brother or a grandmother who no longer know who you are. 
some of me some of you may have listened to Bill Gates talk recently about his personal experiences with family members affected by Alzheimer's and his newest mission in donating up to 50 million of his own money to the Dementia Discovery Fund to support continued research in pursuit of not only better treatments, but hopefully ultimately a cure for this disease. So like Bill Gates, Premier Research and its employees are committed to being a part of drug development for unmet medical needs such as Alzheimer's disease. So with that said, let me introduce the agenda topics for Dr. Turek's presentation today. Uh, Sebastian will cover types of therapies, uh, what's in the development pipeline, maybe how that aligns with what you may be looking to pursue, and then some very important points related to increasing the success rate of your Alzheimer's trial. You can see here some of the topics that he'll cover. So I hope you enjoy this presentation and get a few nuggets of important uh, information to take with you. And with that, I'll hand, hand it over to Dr. Torak. Thank you, Krista, and thank you, Andrew. Good morning, good everyone. Um, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I believe we are all here because we share a common goal and passion to Alzheimer's disease, and um, we all want to find an effective treatment for this terrible disease and associated symptoms. And as you know, there's been nothing new on the market since 2003 when Memantin got the FDA approval. And we probably all know that Alzheimer's disease is the most common dementia in late life. And uh, as Krista mentioned, most of us either know or knew somebody with Alzheimer, or maybe even our families were affected by this disease. There are about 47 million people worldwide living with dementia, and unfortunately, this number is expected to increase to 75 million in 2030 and 150 million in 2050. And obviously, the cost of healthcare for these patients could raise up to $2 trillion in 2030. I'm sure you all agree that it's critical that we join our efforts and develop new pharmacolog pharmacologic therapies for AD patients and their families. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, let's jump into our discussion today. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the National Alzheimer Project Act, which mandated the formulation of the national plan to address Alzheimer's disease. And in 2012, that plan articulated the goal of preventing and effectively treating Alzheimer's by 2025. I would like to quickly review the past failures and future opportunities on the way to get the powerful medication on the market by the year of 2025. We'll start with symptomatic therapies, and first is the group of well-known cholinesterase inhibitors approved by FDA. Those are obviously donepezil, rivastigmine, and galantamine. Several other molecules from this group were investigated, but ultimately found to be unsuccessful due to lack of efficacy, intolerable side effects, or simply impractical or ineffective dosing. Obviously, approval of new formulations and dosing of currently existing medication has occurred, but unfortunately, no novel drugs. The nicotine receptor agonists, um, little success thus far. The development of both full and partial agonists of M1 muscarinic receptors has been limited due to adverse events. There are currently agents targeting sigma-1 and muscarinic receptors under development and investigation. In addition to memantine approved by FDA, and as mentioned earlier, other NMDA receptors antagonists were tested without success. Also, glutamate AMPA receptor modulators have not shown success thus far. A number of serotonin receptors have been postulated to be potential therapeutic targets for a cognitive, behavioral, and uh, affective symptoms of AD, but have not shown evidence of significant efficacy in clinical trials conducted thus far. The H3 receptor antagonists have been tested without success either. And a number of other agents targeting various neurotransmitter systems have been tested but have not been successful, and unfortunately that includes the GABA-B antagonist and the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors. I did want to mention here the anti-diabetic agents as well. Um, insulin has been tested due to alteration in cerebral glucose metabolism observed in AD, and there are currently studies where intranasal insulin and peroxisome proliferated activated receptor gamma agonists, as well as the glucagon-like peptid-1 agonists, are tested on various stages of the disease. And finally, various miscellaneous compounds and therapies, such as deep brain simulation, a transcranial magnetic brain simulation, curcumin, estrogen replacement therapy, acetyl-L-carnitine, ginkgo biloba, and isercoline, 
omega-3 fatty acid also failed to show efficacy in AD studies. Now moving to the disease modifying therapy, there are two dominant pathways of disease modifying therapies and those are anti-amyloid agents and tau targeted therapies. The amyloid therapy uh, hypothesis has been the main target for disease modification um, therapies for over 20 years. And without going into details, the goal of anti-amyloid agents is to decrease production, prevent aggregation, or to increase removal of A beta cleaved from APP by sequential action of beta and gamma secretases producing A beta fragments. The challenge with gamma secretase inhibitors is unfortunately poor selectivity as these compounds are also targeting NOTCH. And given the safety issues in previous trials, there are concerns regarding gamma secretase inhibitors. Also, modulators of gamma secretase have not met with success thus far. Much more promising group are the agents targeting beta sites of APP cleaving enzyme, also called BASE, and there are currently a number of clinical trials testing drugs targeting inhibition of BASE, but unfortunately one of the most disappointing news from early this year was Merck's decision to shut down EPOC study with BASE inhibitor verubicestat in mild to moderate Alzheimer due to virtually no chance of success. Another group in the clinical development are molecules to bind the, to, to soluble A beta forms and aim to prevent further aggregation causing cell death. Active and passive immunotherapy in, in AD treatment is designed to clear A beta and reduce its toxic effect. But given the decreased immune system response of elderly patients to vaccination, I believe that active immunotherapy may be best implemented in a younger population or possibly as part of prevention strategy. The passive immunotherapy has advantages over active immunotherapy because of the ability to target specific domains of amyloid. Passive therapy has uh, also a lower risk of irreversible autoimmune complications. But again, one of the biggest disappointments in the last 12 months was the failure of solanezumab, um, a monoclonal antibody in, uh, of Eli Lilly, to meet primary endpoints in the Expedition 3 trial. This failure and also other failures of anti amyloid agents to reach primary clinical endpoints have shifted focus to other approaches and therapies such as tau-targeted therapies. And currently in development we have uh, immunotherapy agents simulating immune system to produce antibodies against phosphorylated tau protein. We also have molecules targeting kinases involved in phosphorylating the tau protein. We have tau aggregation inhibitors and microtubule stabilizers. In addition, I want to mention antioxidant and anti-inflammatory agents because part of the pathogenesis of AD includes microinflammation. And numerous antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, cholesterol-lowering agents, homocysteine-lowering agents, and neuroprotectants have been essentially negative. And finally, not mentioned here on the slide are potential new agents for many, many different behavioral disturbances associated with AD, such as depression, agitation, or aggressiveness. Andrew, I, I believe it's time now for our first polling question. That's right, and that polling question is up on your screens right now, and you can vote on this in real time by clicking on uh, any of the options there. The question we have for you, what type of therapy are you most interested in with regards to your research? Is that symptomatic, disease modifying, or therapy for behavioral changes? So again, you can vote on this in real time. I encourage you to do so. A lot of you are voting right now, so thanks for doing that. Uh, what type of therapy are you most interested in with regard uh, to your research? So it looks like most of you have voted on this. Thanks for doing so. We'll close polling now and share the results with everyone. Let's have a look. 71% uh, of you saying disease modifying, 14% uh, of you saying symptomatic, and another 14% saying therapy for behavioral changes. And with that, I'll hand the mic back to you. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, obviously very interesting to see these results. Um, and actually, um, you know, they are perfectly in line with a current global development pipeline, and um, you will see on one of my slides uh, that approximately 70% of compounds currently in phase two or phase three are aiming to alter the underlying pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. And the remaining 30% are attempting to lessen the behavioral symptoms often associated with AD. 
All right, uh, with that, let's have a look at the current development pipeline and the breakdown by mechanism of action. On this slide, I am showing the data from Alzheimer's Association presented in July this year during Alzheimer's Association International Conference in London. And according to this data, there are 92 compounds in phase two. As you can see, the breakdown by mechanism of action uh, is also presented on the slide. There are 20 clinical trials in phase two, which have the estimated completion time this year, and then 16 trials in 2018, 15 in 2000. 19 and 2 in 2020. And moving to phase 3, there are 16 compounds in phase 3 registration trials and 5 compounds for AD related symptoms. And in addition, there are 14 compounds in phase 3 academic trials, including 6 compounds for related symptoms. Similarly to phase 2 trials, the majority of tested drugs could be categorized as disease modifying. Now, six trials have estimated completion time this year, seven trials in 2018, 14 in 2019, five trials in 2020, and then four in 21 and three in 22. And in addition, not shown on the slide here are 42 therapeutic compounds in phase one clinical development trials for Alzheimer's disease. And just a quick recap of development timelines um, for the disease modifying therapy after preclinical development and initial characterization of an AD agent, phase one takes approximately 13 months, phase two approximately 28 months, phase three approximately 51 months followed by regulatory review, of approximately 18 months. So including the preclinical development, the total development time reaches even 160 months, which is more than nine years. And you know, apart from shifting the interest from the anti-amyloid therapies to tau-targeted therapies, as I mentioned earlier, something that definitely changed over the last few years is the stage of the disease targeted by a putative therapeutic agents. And it's not a surprise because we know more and more about underlying anatomical and pathophysiologic changes in AD, which begin many years before clinical symptoms. And because of that, the AD research and treatment development shifted to earlier pre-dementia stages of AD known as MCI due to AD or prodromal AD. And in February 2013, the FDA issued draft guidance for the industry regarding development of drugs for the treatment of early stage AD. This guidance addresses some possible adaptation of the current approach to drug development for the treatment of dementia stage of AD that appear more appropriate for clinical trials in early stages of this illness. I will address some of the aspects related to pre-dementia and early stage trials later during this presentation. But just looking at the numbers from clinicaltrials.gov, there are 144 active trials currently. Um, 51 studies are targeting either healthy, healthy at risk through MCI and up to mild stage AD patients. That includes 21 studies targeting completely asymptomatic patients. The other studies are targeting more advanced subjects or a broader spectrum of disease stage from MCI to severe. There are 40 trials um, designed for mild to moderate population and only three for moderate to severe or severe stages. And I guess the key takeaway from these first few slides of my presentation is that, you know, Alzheimer's disease is most certainly one of those diseases where we urgently need a new effective therapies. And I have to say that I'm very happy to see such a large number of ongoing trials because this raises hope for future. However, the many failures in the history of AD clinical trials suggest that either the hypothesis of underlying AD pathophysiology or the design of AD trials must be revised. So, uh, keeping in mind the goal of having the effective treatment on the market by 2025, the question is how can we help you or how can you help yourself to increase the success rate of your AD trial? And one of the possible option is to speed up enrollment by adding ex-US countries to your geographic distribution. And this is simply because in the US, approximately 85 to 90% of trials have delayed recruitment. And unfortunately, this is also something that I personally experienced in my recent large phase three study where I had about 70% of sites from US and that country was responsible for successful enrollment in first few months, but then the recruitment rate went dramatically down. 
And as a result, we started closing non-enrolling US sites and opening European sites to rescue our recruitment targets. And again, looking at the data from clinicaltrials.gov, the sponsors of 144 active trials are conducting their research in 51 countries worldwide. 71% 71, 71 of active trials are being conducted in the US, even though the majority of trial sites are ex-US. Definitely the US has the largest number of trial sites of any single country, however, Cumulatively, nearly half of all sites are outside of US. So let's have a look at the situation in other regions and countries. And I'll start with South and Central America. The leading countries here are Argentina and Mexico with six and five active trials respectively. And unfortunately, the startup timelines are quite long in this region and you need to take this into consideration if you plan to start your trials in this region. In Western Europe, the traditional countries involved in AD trials are UK, France, Germany, Spain and Italy, with 26 to 21 trials currently ongoing. And again, from my experience, I would say that these countries are now highly saturated with AD trials and unfortunately sponsors are competing for access to the same clinical sites, which has an impact on enrollment. In Central and Eastern Europe, the leading country is Poland with 15 active AD trials at the moment. But I would say, uh, from my experience, uh, and this is also uh, the country of my origin, uh, I think that there is still a space for more AD trials in Poland. And other regions, Japan, South Korea and Australia have been traditionally involved, um, especially in large phase three studies. But definitely an emerging country is China with four global trials currently ongoing and actively recruiting patients. You know, conducting 80 trials in China is challenging due to very long timelines and, um, you know, you, you have to expect at least 12 months uh, to get the regulatory approval, but also due to local regulations and due to possible quality concerns. Uh, but it is certainly one of those countries where we all need to be because of the access to enormous population and that also includes naive AD patients, which are really hard to find in other countries and regions. And you know, there are compelling reasons to consider incorporating international sites in AD trials, not only because of the recruitment, however, I have to mention here a couple of aspects that should always be taken into consideration when, when planning global AD trial. And I start with education levels and this item varies substantially from country to country. And for instance, the average education level in the US is 12 years, whereas in China it is 6.4. And it is known that individuals with lower levels of education tend to progress more slowly in the course of AD. Secondly, individuals with higher level of exercise, which is also country dependent, have lower levels of amyloid deposits in the brain. Also, differences in body size are definitely expected to contribute to differences in brain exposure levels when patients of different size are given similar doses of drugs. And European nations are usually higher than Asian. Obesity likely may affect drug metabolism and distribution as well. And obesity is more common in Western populations. Also, polymorphism influencing drug metabolism varies substantially across ethnic groups and can contribute importantly to differences in drug metabolism, central nervous system drug exposure and drug response. And there are more slow metabol metabolizers in Asian populations. Genetic diversity also creates differences in the biology of AD relevant to clinical trials. For instance, the apolipoprotein E4 varies between ethnicities and region. Differences in perception of AD symptoms may lead to late diagnosis of AD. And please be aware that Asian countries place, place less emphasis on the importance of memory in aging, and AD is less likely to be perceived as an abnormality in those countries. Also, rates of apathy are lower in Asia compared to US populations, possibly due to differences in expectations of activity levels. And also the role of caregiver may be more straightforward in Western countries than in many developing nations where patients tend to live at home in extended families with multiple caregivers. This is a challenge because the presence of reliable caregiver is essential for AD trials and usually the protocols defines a reliable caregiver as someone who spends at least 10 hours per week with a patient. 
The use of clinical trial instruments and equipment may vary between regions as well. Um, I am going to talk about scales later during this presentation, but I have to mention here that nearly all widely used clinical trial instruments for AD were developed in North America. And as a result, the data collected from different countries may be affected by cultural and national influences. Also, the biological measures are differentially acceptable across international trial sites. For instance, Asian patients are more reluctant to undergo invasive procedures and less likely to participate in trials, including lumbar puncture, which may significantly affect enrollment if CSF is part of your screening process. And again, from my experience in China, it's very hard to convince patients and their family to donate the spinal fluid for entry analysis. I remember that when I did the initial feasibility in China looking for sites willing to participate in disease-modifying study, some of the sites declare no more than one patient per six months because of the lumbar puncture, which was mandatory screening procedure in that protocol. Also, the biomarker capacity may vary markedly among global sites. Western countries and some Asian countries tend to be early adopters of new technology compared to other countries. Also, remember that the use of phantom scans for image standardization and machine calibration may not be familiar to all sites. And if you are the sponsors of international trials, you will need to provide additional technical expertise to ensure quality. My other suggestion would be to use centralized reading of brain images to minimize site-to-site -site variability in image interpretation. And even more important is the availability of radioactive tracers used in AD in different countries, because limited access to new tracers slows down enrollment and force investigators to use lumbar puncture, which is the less preferred method of confirming amyloid burden in many Asian and Eastern European countries, as mentioned earlier. And the next aspect to consider is the overall experience of your sites. So you need to be aware that both the investigators and their sites vary widely with regards to their experience in conducting AD clinical trials. If you have raters with no experience or poor experience, you'll probably end up with a greater score variability and more difficulty demonstrating a drug placebo difference of an effective compound. In all my previous large phase three trials, we did involve a third party vendor to provide standardized training for raters all over the world. And additionally, as a preventive solution, I always highly recommend the in-study rater surveillance programs where the vendor is evaluating the data coming from raters in nearly real time during the course of study, sometimes including video or audio tape interviews and providing ongoing tutorials. It's not a cheap service, but the quality of data is most certainly improved. And finally, regulatory and legal considerations. If you look for marketing or authorization of your products in international markets, strategies and requirements differ by country. Sample collection and handling may pose challenges in global trials as well. For instance, some countries have restrictions on DNA and plasma export. And again, my, my favorite China is a good example here. Uh, and that actually require identification and standardization of a reference lab within a country if you want to pursue your trial in that country. I want to finish this section of our presentation by saying that um, I personally am a great fan of uh, global AD trials. Um, in my career, I managed studies conducted uh, in Asia Pacific, Europe, um, and obviously as well as North, Central and South America. And I know it's not easy to understand all those nuances and differences in, in clinical conduct in different regions, but that's actually one of the reasons why sponsors can use CROs to get that support and knowledge in order to improve the successful conduct of the trial in a global matrix. What else do you need to consider to increase your success rate in AD trial? Well, one of the possible reasons of recent failures, as mentioned, um, may be a poor protocol design. Uh, and most typical AD clinical trial design was created in the development programs for cholinesterase inhibitors and memantine, and these are double-blind, placebo-controlled, uh, parallel group clinical trials with a dual outcome, including a cognitive measure and a global impression or activities of daily living outcome. 
and in that typical designs, patients are randomized to drug or placebo, and the change from baseline in a, in a placebo group is compared to change to baseline in a treatment group after a specific number of weeks or months. Uh, usually, the tested new therapy is an add-on treatment to a standard of care. I mentioned earlier that um, the majority of compounds under investigation are within disease modifying group and you know it's um, it's it's pretty obvious that clinical trials in AD are often struggling to find ways to separate out symptomatic effects of potential agents from disease modifying effects. There are clinical trials designed developed to try to adjust for the symptomatic effects of putative disease modifying agents and allow clinical rating scales to be used on endpoints. I would like to mention here a couple of designs as examples, uh, starting with a wash-in analysis which compares the change between groups in clinical outcome measures over the first few weeks or months of the study. And if you see a greater improvement in an active agent than placebo-treated subjects, this could potentially indicate an early symptomatic effect. And this is because the true disease-modifying effect would not be seen so soon. This design is often combined with other design strategies. And then the second is the washout analysis. In this analysis, treatment is withdrawn from both the active agent and placebo-treated groups at the end of the study. The active agent is assumed to have disease-modifying properties if patients treated with this agent show slower disease progression throughout the double-blind treatment period than those treated with placebo and less severe deterioration when treatment is withdrawn. There are a number of problems with this study design and uh, probably, you know, potential problems with different protocol designs are a good topic for another webinar. I'm not going to focus on that during this presentation. Uh, and the next design I wanted to mention here is the delayed start design, where one group of patients is randomized to receive the active agent from the beginning, while the rest are randomized to receive placebo initially and then the active agent at the later time point, which is exactly the delayed start. And in theory, if the putative agent has a purely symptomatic effect, then when the second group receives the drug, the progression curves for both groups should meet. However, if the compound has a purely disease-modifying effect, then the progression curves of the delayed start group will never catch up with those treated from the beginning. And again, there are several problems with the delayed start design, which make which may make drawing conclusions about an agent's disease-modifying properties on the results of such trial questionable. A futility study compares the outcome of a single treated group against a predetermined threshold value reflective of a clinically meaningful change. Futility studies may use a placebo control arm, but often use a, a historical controls to establish the threshold for clinical meaningfulness. And the advantage of futility studies is that fewer patients are observed for a shortened periods of time in phase two to facilitate decisions about which agents should be prioritized to advance to phase three. Well-designed long-term follow-up trials where disease modification is inferred from sustained divergence in outcome measures group over the time, between groups over the time, may well be the best current trial designed to show disease modification. However, these studies are time-consuming and expensive, and it's not really clear how long follow-up studies should be. And certainly, very attractive protocol design represents the adaptive design, which can minimize the overall sample size and duration of your study by stopping recruitment early in response to strong signals of success or futility based on regular inter interim analysis. An important challenge for this design is the difficulty of assessing the outcome measure early enough so modification of the randomization occur well before recruitment is complete. This challenge can be addressed by using a Bayesian design, which has numerous advantages over a traditional phase two proof of concept and over other statistical approaches. But there are a number of limitations, and I, I, will, I will just mention two. Uh, designing a Bayesian adaptive trial requires extensive planning. And your study teams must consider numerous scenarios for possible outcomes and invest lots of time on a lengthy simulation process. And second, you will need a rapid flow of data from sites to, to your database, so interim analysis can be performed in real time to adjust the randomization ratios on schedule and provide the study team with early stopping decisions if a boundary is met. 
And finally, I cannot forget here about novel designs that emerge for behavioral disturbances uh, studies in AD. And I will just mention three examples of protocol design for these trials. Withdrawal design is a novel compared to usual approach. Delay to onset design may be of value in AD trials focusing on symptom management as well. And an interesting and novel design that seeks to minimize the placebo group response is the parallel sequential comparative design. We have two phases in this design and in phase one there is a traditional comparison of treatment and placebo groups. At the end of phase one the placebo non-responders are re-randomized to treatment or placebo. And the final comparison is between active treatment and placebo in the placebo non-responders of phase one. The placebo response in phase one may approach 40% while the placebo response in phase two is about 10%. This design is recommended to reduce problematic placebo groups responses. And very much related to protocol design is the problem of missing data. Um, given that about 25% of AD trial participants are failing to complete the double-blind treatment periods, the results of these studies may be confounded by missing data. Missing data can result in several problems, including unbalancing the treatment arms over time and introducing bias. And moreover, missing data reduce the overall efficacy of the study. There are methods such as complete case analysis, last observation carried forward, data imputation, survival analysis and mixed models that we can use to deal with missing primary outcome data. Andrew, I believe it's time now for our second polling question. That's right, and that polling question, the second and final of the day, is up on your screens. And again, you can vote on this in real time by clicking on the options there. Uh, the question we have for you this time, are you planning to use a third-party vendor for centralized in-study raters surveillance? Uh, options, pretty simple here this time. Yes, no, or maybe that's not applicable to you at this point. Uh, are you planning to use a third-party vendor for centralized in-study rater surveillance? All right, looks like most of you have voted on this question, so I'll close polling now, and I'll share the results as well with the audience. 57% of you saying that's not applicable to you right now, 29% saying yes, and 14% saying no. And with that, I'll hand the mic back to you. Thanks, uh, Andrew. And you know the reason uh, why I decided to ask this question is because on the next few slides you'll see examples of various clinical instruments used to measure clinical endpoints. And especially if you plan to conduct global trial with countries from different regions, it's important that you think about standardized training for raters as well as a proper support and surveillance during the study to increase the quality of your primary or co-primary data. And unfortunately, you know, despite the extensive development of rating scales, the overall assessment of disease progression in routine medical practice is lengthy and complicated. And obviously, it's not my intention to talk about rating assessment in details, because this could be a topic for at least two webinars, but um, I believe it's important to perhaps categorize and, uh, and summarize the scales typically used in AD and also to indicate which are the novel instruments. And I'll start with cognition. The most commonly, still commonly used scale for assessment of cognition is a mini mental state examination, MMSE. I'm sure you know that there are several drawbacks limiting the utility of MMSE. Some items are just too easy and therefore patients with mild AD are not sensitively evaluated because of the ceiling effect. Um, and in contrast, floor effect limit the application to patients with more advanced AD. But nevertheless, this scale is still commonly used and in all my previous trials for mild to moderate population, we always used MMSE to confirm the stage of the disease. Another scale used in almost all clinical trials on symptomatic AD therapy is the ADAS. The cognitive subscale, the COG, is a standard tool in pivotal clinical trials to detect therapeutic effect in cognition. And for example, the change, um, the, the, the change from baseline in ADAS COG 13 is the primary outcome measure in one of the Eli Lilly's base inhibitor study on, um, on mild AD, the current, currently ongoing study. But because MMSE and ADASCOG are not sensitive enough to optimally measure treatment effects in early disease stage, um, there is a scale that fills this gap, and it's called Neuropsychological Test Battery. But I will be talking about scales for early stages of AD in a few moments. 
And in contrast, for assessment of cognition in a later AD stage, the severe impairment battery can be used. Uh, and there is also a short SIB version and the version based on a language domain. Another brief and reliable and, val uh, and valid measure of um, cognitive function in severely demented AD patients is a severe cognition impairment rating scale. And for the activities of daily living, in general, the basic ADL that identifies um, self-maintenance um, skills such as walking, uh, feeding, dressing, are distinguished from the instrumental activities of daily living, uh, which address more complex activities such as shopping, cooking, handling finances, or using the telephone or transportation. And the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative study 19 item version uh, covers mainly basic ADL. Therefore, it's used for the assessment of patients with more severe AD. While the 23 item version includes more complex ADL for the assessment of mild to moderate AD, such as reading books or magazines or, or pastime activities. And uh, as examples only, I, I did want to mention few commonly used scales for functional assessments. Um, those are disability assessment for dementia, the interview for deterioration in daily living activities in dementia, the functional um, autonomy measurement system, and many, many more. We'll now move to uh, global impression assessments. Uh, the, the clinical global impression scales rely on clinicians' rating of global severity and or change in patients' clinical condition. And I'm sure you all know this type of scale because it's commonly used in uh, clinical trials for various diseases. The global measures include global severity scales, such as uh, commonly used clinical dementia rating, global deterioration scale, a functional assessment staging, and a global change scale, such as Alzheimer's Disease Co Cooperative Study, a clinical global impression of change, or the New York University Clinicians Interview-Based Impression of Change plus caregiver input. And I mentioned earlier that care caregiver plays pivotal role in AD studies and there are a number of instruments designed to interview a caregiver. A couple of examples for scales assessing behavior, the behave AD or brief psychiatric rating scales could be good examples, but presently the most widely used behavior scale is the neuropsychiatric inventory which distinguishes between frequency and severity of symptoms. Other instruments used in clinical settings for rating behavioral abnormalities are instruments targeting specific behaviors such as uh, the Cohen-Mansfield Agitation Inventory uh, for Agitation and Aggressiveness or the Geriatric Depression Scale for Depression, the Apathy Inventory. And in addition, there are instruments designed specifically for assessment of depression severity and mood changes in demented patients. And those are, for instance, the Dementia Mood Assessment Scale, the Cornell Scale for Depression in Dementia, or the Alzheimer's Mood Scale. And finally, the quality of life, communication, and social interactions. The most popular quality of life scales are Alzheimer's disease related quality of life, the dementia quality of life instrument, the quality of life Alzheimer's disease, the quality of life in late stage dementia scale, and progressive deterioration scales, which has been designed specifically for AD patients. And an example of scale for evaluation of semantic and pragmatic problems in communication with AD patients is a communication problem scale. And as we shift focus from more advanced stage to an earlier, often asymptomatic stage, we need to use more sensitive and responsive instruments. And the examples could be the free and cute selective recall reminding test, used to identify patients with MCI with high sensitivity and specificity. Clinical dementia rating, sum of boxes mentioned earlier, assesses both cognitive and functional features of AD and has psychometric properties that make it appropriate as an outcome for patients meeting criteria for MCI. And again, as an example only, the change from baseline in CDR sum of boxes score is the primary outcome measure in currently ongoing Biogen's aducanumab study for MCI and mild AD patients, and similarly for ACE's LNBESESTAT study for the same population. The cognitive function instrument, uh, the CS, CFA, CFI, is intended to detect early changes in cognitive and functional abilities in individuals with preclinical impairment without clinical impairment.
apologize. Many computerized neurological assessments, which uh, offer a great degree of sensi sensitivity, are also available. But unfortunately, computer experience can influence test performance and is likely to be uh, more of a challenge in elderly individuals. And finally, the composites um, and you know the development and validation of new scale. The novel is a long process. Um, recent efforts have focused on development of composites, which capture only those components from existing scales that have the ability to discern and decline in early AD populations. And the FDA has also indicated that a single composite outcome may be appropriate for trials with MCI prodromal AD patients. I'm going to just give you a few examples here. The integrated Alzheimer's disease rating scale uh, comprised of uh, scores from ADASCOC and instrumental ADCS ADL. The AD composite score comprised of four ADASCOC items, two MMSE items, and all six clinical dementia rating sum of box items. Or for preclinical trials, the ADCS preclinical Alzheimer cognitive composite is a cognitive composite of scores from four well-known scales. As you can see, um, as you heard, there are a couple of dozens probably of clinical scales that you can use for your AD trial. But my recommendation is to be selective and to focus on those that you really need. Um, what I can say from my experience is that the number of procedures at study visits have significantly increased in the past 10 years. And very often study visits must take more than one day to complete all assessment. And unfortunately, this is perceived by patients and caregivers as a significant burden, reducing their interest to participate in the trial. Another key factor for a success of AD trials is a selection of biomarker. I mentioned earlier that one of the challenges in AD and other neurodegenerative disorders is how to separate out symptomatic effects of potential drugs from the true disease modifying effects. This could be easily addressed if we use a surrogate outcome biomarker as an endpoint. But unfortunately, there isn't any single acceptable surrogate outcome biomarker for AD. In the past few years, I saw many researchers on the associations between different biomarkers and clinical measures of disease severity. So let me just give you a, a, um, a couple of examples of the uh, most commonly assessed biomarkers in AD trials. We'll start with the CSF biomarkers, um, and most commonly investigated are a total tau, or the tau phosphorylated at treonine 181 or 231. The isoforms of amyloid beta, uh, the A beta 42, 38, 37, as well as the soluble amyloid beta. And you know, people with mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease have lower CSF A beta 42 and higher total tau and phosphorylated tau. And something to remember is that the main changes in the core CSF biomarkers occur during the asymptomatic phase of AD. These biomarkers are not very dynamic during the symptomatic phase. That's why it's critical to identify those patients early enough. For the brain PET biomarkers, uh, different brain regions have been evaluated to measure the change in binding of radioactive ligand. Uh, the typical PET ligand are FDG, the Pittsburgh compound B, uh, a ligand targeting amyloid plaques such as fluorbethopyr, and ligands targeting tau such as fluortausipir, for instance. Um, the availability of fluorbethopyr, even though it's commercially available in the US and, and some EU countries, is unfortunately limited in other regions. Fluortausipir is even less available, and um, you need to take it into consideration when planning global AD trials. I started with these two biomarkers types because many clinical studies on the disease-modifying agents use either CSF or PET measures of amyloid as inclusion criteria, and um, the negative results of such tests are unfortunately predominant reasons of screen failures, especially in a less advanced AD populations. And I remember in one of my previous AD study on mild AD patients, we had 50% screen failure rate due to CSF or PET results not meeting the criteria of inclusion according to the algorithm used to assess amyloid deposition in these studies. I've also seen screen failure rates due to negative uh, CSF or PET being even up to 70% in the MCI patients, which had tremendous impact on enrollment strategy. 
Uh, moving forward, there have been studies on a potential use of biomarkers from plasma, uh, blood and serum. And these potential biomarkers were the platelet amyloid beta precursors protein isoform ration, the neopterin, the C-reactive protein, a tumor necrosis factor alpha, or insulin-like growth factor 1. Unfortunately, studies have failed to find a robust and reproducible relationship between A-beta-42 levels in brain and blood, suggesting that perhaps blood might not reliably indicate disease. Those of you who attended AAIC in London this year probably heard about new method of measuring plasma A-beta that relies on mass spectrometry. It's very promising, but it does require further validation. The volumetric MRI measurement of different parts of brain at the moment seems to be the most linked to cognitive decline. And finally, ultrasound biomarkers and CT brain biomarkers have also been studied. And I want to go back now to enrollment. Um, and, you know, the struggle to enroll patients is a long standing problem dating back to, to mid 1990s. And the factors to slow recruitment include primary care physicians' lack of capacity and resources to assess cognition and refer patients to research or barriers to participation for underrepresented communities, such as lack of cultural sensitivity, the requirement for study partner for most Alzheimer's trials, the use of invasive procedures, such as lumbar puncture or brain imaging, as mentioned earlier, the high screen failure rate, also mentioned earlier, and finally, the poor setup of clinical sites. So, how can we overcome these challenges and improve enrollment rate in AD trials? Well, we can definitely appeal to current participants. Um, they already demonstrated eligibility for trial entry criteria, as well as motivation to participate. And many participants are eager to enroll in subsequent studies after trial completion or stoppage. We can also increase uh, clini clinical referrals. The number of memory care clinics operating in the US is increasing and many are not affiliated with medical schools or universities and probably the ideal site is when you have a concentration of a large number of AD patients having well-established relationship to a clinic. Also community physicians may be willing to refer participants however First, we need to increase our awareness, their awareness of AD trials, and secondly, overcome barriers to referral. Sites can use mailing lists more intensively, uh, for instance, to mail recruitment materials in order to identify new volunteers. Also, advertising is a, is a typical approach taken to support enrollment. In all my previous studies, we used local and national advertisements in newspapers, television and radio, as well as a public service announcement. I have to say, with different success, and definitely one of my lessons learned was that the use of advertisement has legal limitation and acceptance in different countries. Um, and one thing, however, is clear for everyone who deals with enrollment challenges in, in AD is that we strongly need to launch a major national media campaigns designed to increase public awareness regarding the critical need for volunteers or as participants for clinical studies, including healthy individuals for prevention study. Another initiative to boost enrollment is the outreach to the surrounding communities and partnership with community organizations. And this often takes form of providing community lectures and seminars. Also, social media is becoming more relevant to Alzheimer research. It can be developed easily, changed instantly, and used to reach a wide audience. And finally, network. A trial execution can be far more efficient if there is an integrated standing network of clinical trial sites. And these clinical trial platforms may include local disease registries, uh, trial-ready cohorts, and they are increasingly being pursued as a way to assure less redundancy and greater speed compared to the existing clinical trial procedures. Fostering stronger ties between clinical practice and the research will also speed trial recruitment. I'll give you um, here a couple of examples of comprehensive AD centers where clinical activities and research efforts are brought together so that patient care and clinical study of AD occur in a more integrated fashion. 
And those examples could be the Gérard de Paul in Toulouse, France, uh, the Salpetrier Dementia Research Center in Paris, France, the Amsterdam Dementia Cohort in the Netherlands, the German Dementia Competence Network, the Cleveland Clinic Lua Ruvo Center for Brain Health in the US, and the University of Southern California Alzheimer Therapeutic Research Institute in the US. And um, very powerful source of patient, um, of potential AD patients, are participants' registries. Person enrolled in such registries have already expressed a willingness to participate in research and may have defined the type of studies they are or are not interested in and can be quickly contacted up an IRB approval of a new protocol. National registries include these specific models such as Alzheimer Association Trial Match and the, Associ the Association Prevention Registry and have a variety of strengths including the potential for greater publicity through national campaigns. And I'll give you a couple of examples of the registries currently in place. Those are the Alzheimer Prevention Registry, the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer Network Trial Units Expanded Registry. This is um, this is a registry focus on, focusing on individuals at risk of having a gene mutation that causes dominantly inherited AD. The Brain Health Registry, the Global Alzheimer Platform Initiative, the Cleveland Clinic Healthy Brain Registries, the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study, which is a federal university. Um, uh, collaboration and the Joint Dementia Research Initiative in the UK. As you can see from these few slides, focusing on enrollment, there are many techniques and tools that we can use and successfully implement in the study to boost enrollments. Some of them are more powerful than others, not all will work in all your countries, and I think that the understanding of patient pathways and the local regulations will definitely help in tailoring the methods that will work best in your study. And finally, I would like to summarize in few points the consideration for future trials. We'll definitely need a surrogate biomarker to decrease trial duration and effectively separate symptomatic effects of drugs from disease-modifying effects. Future studies, particularly for disease-modifying agents, will focus more and more on targeting the earlier stages of disease. Future clinical trial designs, including study duration, population size, and primary cognitive and functional endpoints will need to be further optimized. We all need to continue our efforts to bridge the gap between research and clinical care to improve enrollment and public awareness of the disease. And finally, we need to improve the performance of this and the structure of clinical sites, especially for a global multi-country studies. That brings us to the end of the presentation today. Andrew, I'm not sure if we have time for any questions from the audience. Yes, I think uh, we'll ask at least uh, one or two questions here. Thank you so much for that presentation. Also, thank you uh, to Dr. Armstrong for her portion of the presentation as well. Um, at this point, I would like to ask our audience to continue sending in their questions and their comments. And right now, using that chat window, this, of course, is the Q&A portion of the webinar, and uh, let's get started with at least one question here. Uh, on one of the presented slides related to enrollment, uh, this audience member noticed a concept of national core site. Uh, could you elaborate more on that? Yes, sure, and uh, Krista, I'll take this slide, and uh, thank you very much for, for this question. So as far as I remember, it was um, in 2016 in conjunction, in conjunction with AAIC in Toronto when um, a group of key stakeholders from academia, uh, industry, uh, government and uh, probably non-profit sectors met to discuss enrollment challenges in AD studies and a potential solution. And one of the long-term solutions that the group proposed was a concept of a national core design it as a multi-user resource to help clinical trials and longitudinal observational studies seeking to recruit participants. 
um, a shared research resource has been proposed as well in various forms as an integral part of several founding mechanisms um, by the National Health Institute and others. But also the concept of a core facility has been uh, used as a standalone research resource for the purpose of collecting, banking um, and, um, and distributing other research resources such as uh, for instance, cells, tissues, and other biofluids. Um, this and other models should be further studies, and um, I think that suitable models should be selected in the future. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have reached the end of the question and answer portion of this particular webinar, but if you do have some further questions, you can uh, write those questions into the email address showing on your screen right now. That's info at premier-research.com. And if we weren't able to attend to your questions today, we did get a few coming in through the chat box, uh, the team at Premier Research will try to follow up with you after the webinar. And thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. You'll be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event and a survey window will be popping up on your screen shortly. Your participation is appreciated as it'll help us improve our further webinars. And I also sent you a link in your chat box. You can say thanks to our speakers and tweet about the webinar using that link on Twitter, so I encourage you to do so. Great presentation today and, and great Q&A as well. Thanks to Dr. Sebastian Turek and Dr. Krista Armstrong. We hope that you found this webinar informative today. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.